should get started. Uh, I realise it's uh, pretty much the end of the program and we've all had a couple of days of action-packed information and your hard drives are probably overloaded. I know mine is already and things have started falling off. I've forgotten more than I, <laughs> I've remembered. <laughs> uh, so we'll see how we go with nitrogen. It's re it really is a, it's a, it's an incredibly important topic when we think about the wider environmental implications of nitrogen use and also the implications from a personal level to what it's actually doing to our bodies. It is a very potent carcinogen in organic nitrogen. I haven't got that in my talk, but uh, I've just remembered it now. Uh, slides. Okay, let's see if the slide uh, sort of works today. So applied nitrogen. I'm talking when I'm when I'm talking about applied nitrogen. I'm talking about inorganic nitrogen fertilizer. The uptake of nitrogen applied to crops or pastures is generally only 10 to 40 percent. I'm not sure whether the farmers using it recognise that, and that's due to substantial losses. It's a very volatile compound. It's either going to go up into the air, volatilise into the air, uh, or it's going to leach and it's going to move. It's going to end up in the water uh, and um, or in our food as nitrate, in our pastures as nitrates, which is very detrimental to, to animals. But 60 to 90 percent of the nitrogen that's applied is lost uh, to either volatilisation or leaching. And globally, farmers spend $100 billion on nitrogen fertilisers every year. That means that between 60 and $90 billion of this either goes into the air or pollutes the water. I mean, even just from an, the economic perspective, it simply doesn't add up for economic reasons. Oh, that's not going to work. All right, it's failed me. Uh, I'm sure you're all very well aware of the environmental implications. I can probably use the little red thing on here. Um, Gulf of Mexico, well-known example in the United States, well-known example around the world actually, <laughs> it's probably one of the things that the United States is very well known for, um, <laughs> environmental pollution. I hate to say that when I'm visiting from another country, that's really disrespectful of me, isn't it? But uh, it is terrible. Yeah. <laughs> oh, we used to think, wasn't, isn't the Mississippi, isn't that your longest river? Is that your longest river? I remember trying to learn to spell it in primary school. You know, M I double S. Anyway, there was a little poem that went with that. But now we're, it's more famous for its environmental pollution, unfortunately. We shouldn't laugh. It's very serious. Um, but I shouldn't laugh either, coming from Australia, because 73% of our iconic Great Barrier Reef is dead. Totally dead. Uh, no chance of reviving it once coral is dead, it's dead, due to fertiliser pollution from agriculture. And the remaining 27% is on its knees and on the way out and we're having like bleaching events almost every other day. Um, when I was a child, you could go up to the Great Barrier Reef and uh, when the tide went out, that just exposed huge amounts of all these amazingly coloured corals that if you wore, um, I don't know what you call them here, like gym shoes, sand shoes, the volleys, that kind of thing, you had to wear something on your feet because it was incredibly sharp. But you could walk out over the, the coral and just see all these amazing little fishes and all sorts of things. It was one of the most extraordinary things for a child to do to be able to walk out in a coral reef. Now you have to get in a jet boat, like a high-speed jet boat, and travel for an hour and a half from the coastline before you find any live coral. So I shouldn't be pointing the finger at what's happening in the United States because we're not doing too well in Australia. And in fact, if we look at other countries in the world, in New Zealand, I mentioned this to someone the other day and they could hardly believe it because they thought New Zealand was clean and green. 90% of lowland rivers in New Zealand, in other words, you've got the mountains and then you've got the lowlands, are not wadeable, let alone swimmable or drinkable. There is no way you could drink the water. And here's the best bit. The New Zealand government actually has a policy to make lowland rivers wadeable by 2040. That's a government policy to make them wadeable, not swimmable or drinkable. What's the cause? Nitrogen fertiliser. In New Zealand now, because of the issues with pollution of waterways from nitrogen, you will have to have a permit to farm as of the 1st of July next year. Now, farmers own the land, have spent millions of dollars on their, their farms. Um, some of them have been in families for generations. They will not have the right to just continue farming after the 1st of July next year unless they meet certain environmental uh, protocols, regulations. And one of those is going to be the amount of nitrogen that they're allowed to use, uh, permitted to use on their farms. There's been a huge amount of uh, <laughs> 
uh, conversations going on about this, as you could imagine, in New Zealand for some time. And one of the things that's been brought into play has been the what they call the grandfather clause. You know, granddad did this, so we should be able to keep doing that. But it's not. Luckily, the regulators have stuck to their to their guns, and uh, you will have to have a permit to farm in New Zealand, simply or most um, prominently because of the nitrogen issues. In China, there used to be uh, a fantastic, or a large, I should say, subsidy on nitrogen fertiliser. It was almost free for farmers to use because the Chinese government was encouraging food production and they found you add in, things grow more. They didn't realise that when you add in and things grow more, they've got nothing in them, but it was just you had more of whatever it was that you were growing. And when you're in China, having more of something's obviously seen as being an advantage. And uh, so farmers were very heavily subsidised to use nitrogen fertilisers. Um, now their soils have dropped to about a pH about uh, three and a half uh, or three, which is a bit like battery acid. And the government now uh, has a policy <laughs> to reduce nitrogen use by 50% by 2020. Now that's by next year, that's only going to be two years away. Right? It's not long from now. So they've really, when the Chinese decide to do something, it's like, <laughs> we are going to do this now. So I, th I think that's fantastic that they're going to reduce nitrogen use by 50% by 2020. And even better, what they're suggesting to replace nitrogen is going to be compost. There's just been, uh, they've been asking us in Australia all the time, like coming over, to come over and um, uh, provide car classes on compost making. Um, because that's what they're going to use to replace the nitrogen. I think that's a fantastic move. So despite the fact that we've had some pretty awful things happening around the world in terms of nitrogen, we've certainly got some governments at least doing something about it. Uh, so that's what's happening like at the policy level, at the national level, uh, global level. Let's just have a look like on farm costs. The overuse of inorganic nitrogen actually limits plant uptake of minerals and trace elements. And that's because Plants can't grow without nitrogen, but if we add it in an inorganic form, then we're taking away the role of the liquid carbon pathway, we're taking away the role of microbes, we're taking away the role of root exudates, all of those things that are so important for the soil ecosystem. We've just given the plant the nitrogen that it needs. It doesn't have to work for it anymore. It doesn't have to photosynthesize for it. It doesn't have to support the soil microbiome to, to fix the nitrogen that it needs. And so plants not uptaking minerals and trace elements either. So we've just got a plant that's being fed on nitrogen. It's just going to have nitrogen and water. Um, and it's not even photosynthesizing enough to convert the nitrogen that it takes up into complete protein. So we have incomplete proteins and we have carcinogenic elements in those plants because the whole thing has been unbalanced by the nitrogen. Well, what happens if we've got um, plants lacking in minerals and trace elements? Well, I'm sure everybody here has figured that out. The plant's going to be more susceptible to pests and diseases in the same way that we are when we lack trace elements. Um, then you have to start using insecticides and fungicides on your plants. So farmer input costs are going to go up um, and therefore their profits are going to come down. And do we really want all those insecticides and fungicides on our food? As a general rule, globally even, um, those things are used because the soil is totally out of balance. And one of the things that throw it out of balance is the use of nitrogen fertiliser. So that in turn, if the plants aren't taking up the minerals and trace elements, that has negative flow and effects for animal and human health. Um, and just to use, uh, to go back to use the New Zealand example, uh, again, they're finding that their vet bills are often, dairy farmers in New Zealand, are finding that their vet bills are their highest input cost. If you look at their feed costs, their fertiliser costs, their fuel costs, um, their land rates, all of that, the vet bill is the highest uh, individual cost for their farm. And that, again, just is all traced back to the use of nitrogen fertiliser. Um, I did mention that inorganic nitrogen forms non-protein nitrogen. That's funny, funny protein, as they call it. It's not complete protein. Our bodies don't recognise that when we consume it. Animals' don't, bodies don't recognise it when they consume it. And it stimulates weeds. Um, if, you, if you want lots of weeds, add lots of nitrogen. So worldwide, we're seeing uh, excessive use of nitrogen and phosphorus. So I'm not going to talk about phosphorus today, um, but it's just as bad in many ways. Inorganic phosphorus has caused, has caused uh, soil degradation, uh, environmental pollution. It's reduced soil biodiversity because we don't have carbon flowing into the soil to support the soil microbiome. 
and that has resulted in trace element deficiencies in plants, animals and people. So just to sum all that up, it's expensive, like it's inefficient, I mean, in terms of like the money spent, you don't get the money back from it. Um, it's costing farmers, you know, some of our farmers will spend a hundred or two hundred thousand dollars easily just on one application of nitrogen on their farms. It's highly inefficient uh, and it's polluting. So why do we use it? Yeah, it's a habit, but why, why do farmers, you know, why do they go out and spend a hundred thousand dollars on a load of urea? What, why are they using it? Sorry? Yeah, that's the way they understand the system. But what have they been told? I mean, I have some plants here in a, in a pot, for example. I'm going to add some nitrogen. What, what will happen? What will I see when I add some nitrogen? It's going to grow more. Okay, so farmers use it because things grow more. It makes the grass grow, but is it just empty grass? So what we see with uh, in our dairy, I'll just show you this. This is uh, some data from Australian dairying. Um, and it shows, I've got the slides mixed around. Uh, here's the slide. Okay, so what we have is, I'm just gonna show on this one screen here because this is the one that's filmed. So on this side we have um, how much nitrogen's being used or how many uh, litres of milk are being produced. That's on the other side, so it's got cut off. And over, over time here, so the red line is how much milk has been produced over that period of time. Okay, this line is how much nitrogen has been applied over that period of time. For some reason, farmers, not just dairy farmers, but grain farmers, when things aren't going as they expect, they just keep adding more nitrogen. It just seems to be a thing around the world that, well, if it's not working like we'd like it to, we'll just add more in. And that there is very little relationship. You know, maybe a statistician could, uh, bring up some kind of a relationship. I don't see any relationship there between litres of milk produced and the amount of nitrogen. Now the thing is that when those farmers add that nitrogen, it does make their grass grow more. Like visually it's taller, but it's just empty grass. And the problem is that when it comes to cows, the vat, like what you end up with in the vat, the milk you end up with the vat tells you a lot about the quality of the food that those cows are consuming. You can grow more grass, but if it doesn't have more nutrients in it, if it doesn't have the things in it that cows need to make, uh, to make milk and to make um, milk solids and butter fat, then it's not going to end up with, you're not going to end up with more milk in the vat. Yep. Yeah, but what I'm, what I'm saying is when you look at those two curves, it's not, if, if the nitrogen was actually causing a significant increase in milk production, you'd expect them to be following the same lines. I mean, that is showing, I mean, one of the reasons that we get, we've also seen increases in grain production, what we did until they started to plateau. Over a similar period, we've seen increases in grain production as well, but it's been because of in, improved varieties, improved management, and that sort of thing, that it's not necessarily because of increased levels of nitrogen. Like over time, up until about 2000 actually, um, agricultural production around the world was steadily increasing just because we improved the methods of doing things. Um, so it's not necessarily cause and effect. Um, so what, what I was saying is that if the quality is not there, then you're not going to see the result in the vat in terms of milk. But what happens when we are growing things like grains and vegetables is that we we get it, we could get more of them and they're going to be less nutrient dense. In other words, we're producing empty calories, but it's not showing up as easily as it does with, with milk. Like we have a population that's becoming um, overweight and undernourished, but it's not quite so generally recognised. Um, so the effects are pretty much the same whether we're talking about milk or whether we're talking about grain. And the other issue is that as a result of all the trials that have been done, there's this deeply held belief that plants can only use nitrogen in the inorganic form. So when I'm talking about inorganic nitrogen, I'm talking about ammonium or nitrate. 
which is what all of the fertilisers have in them, either ammonium or nitrate. And this comes from the fact that our, our research trials have been conducted in soils that have been very, very heavily disturbed for the same reasons as I mentioned yesterday, for those of you who are here for the talk about mycorrhiza. You know, soils are collected and put in a great big bunker and they could be stored there for months or years and then they're pulverised and homogenised and sometimes sterilised before they're used for a pot experiment. So if you're doing a trial on nitrogen, the soil that you're going to use has very little or no microbial activity in it so that the only thing that plants can respond to is the nitrogen that you add. There's nothing else. There's not a, um, a robust soil microbiome there that can fix nitrogen for those plants. And, of course, the research trials undertaken... Uh, with cultivation, it's the same sort of thing. There's excessive disturbance. I'm going to talk about how inorganic nitrogen forms, and you'll see, uh, sorry, how organic nitrogen forms. You'll see that um, it can't happen in an environment like that, or even with no-till, if there's lots of chemicals and you still don't have green plants, you haven't got a living soil. Um, there's not going to be any opportunity there for a biological process like free living nitrogen fixation to take place. So we have this biased emphasis on inorganic nitrogen in the literature. And if you Google it, just uh, call up the nitrogen cycle, just to have a look at the nitrogen cycle on Google, and you'll just find uh, depiction after depiction or, or um, graphic after graphic that shows something like this. It'll show this, this loop that starts with the atmosphere, gaseous atmospheric nitrogen, and that runs through all these inorganic forms, ammonium, nitrates, nitrites, nitrates, denitrification goes back as, as, gaseous, um, as gaseous products and then just comes around again or it leaches out, causes eutrophication of water. And there's one little thing on this diagram here that begins with gaseous atmospheric nitrogen, goes to bacterial fixation, and the arrow stops right there. It's not actually showing that as being part of this cycle. It's almost like it doesn't exist. And so when people Google or study at school or study at university the nitrogen cycle, they're taught about all these inorganic forms of nitrogen, almost as if organic nitrogen doesn't even exist. So farmers and the general population could be forgiven for not even knowing what organic nitrogen is. So what is it? If there's all those inorganic forms, like ammonium and ammonia and nitrite and nitrate, what and, and nitrous oxide and all of those things are inorganic nitrogen. So if I'm saying that we need to move away from inorganic nitrogen and start focusing on an organic nitrogen cycle, what am I talking about? What's organic nitrogen? I knew you were going to say that. Manure is what was the answer that I got. Well, manure has just got inorganic nitrogen in it, mostly. Ah, see, organic has different meanings. <laughs> In this room, probably, when we say organic, everyone thinks it's something that's grown without chemicals. If I was talking about chemistry, there's two uh, main components of chem like chemistry. There's two big fields of chemistry. One is organic chemistry and one is inorganic chemistry. So when we're talking about chemistry, what's the difference between inorganic chemistry or organic chemistry? Carbon. Thank you. <laughs> So organic chemistry is the study of compounds that contain carbon and inorganic chemistry is the study of compounds that don't. So when I'm saying organic nitrogen, I mean nitrogen that's bound with carbon in some form, like linked to carbon. I don't mean it's in a carbon compound like, like manure. So what are some chemical, what are some molecules, isn't it fertile, is because it's going to contain nitrogen in the organic form. So the levels of soil organic carbon and organic nitrogen actually increase and decrease together. If we're building stable organic carbon in the soil, of necessity you, well, not of necessity, you are increasing levels of stable organic nitrogen because they are linked. It's not possible to build stable carbon in the soil without also building uh, stable nitrogen. They're part of the same molecule. They increase and decrease together. 
Oops. So how much carbon dioxide is in the atmosphere as a percentage? Now, all you climate change people will all know that. Hardly any. <laughs> 0.04%. 400 parts per million. How much nitrogen is in the atmosphere as a percentage? 78. Which is 78,000 tonnes of nitrogen per hectare, which is about, I don't know, 30,000 tonnes per acre. I can't do acres, sorry, but it's a lot. So there's very little carbon dioxide and a lot of nitrogen that'll do. What's the second most abundant uh, after nitrogen? Nitrogen's obviously at 78%. It's the most abundant oxygen. How much oxygen is there as a percentage? 21. What's 78, 21 add up to? I know it's late, but, you know, it's not hard, is it? 21, 78, 99. 99% of the atmosphere is nitrogen and oxygen. So all of the other gases, hydrogen, helium, margon, carbon dioxide, they all make up that remaining 1%. So everything other than nitrogen and oxygen is a trace gas, including carbon dioxide. So what's the limiting factor here? Carbon or nitrogen? Yes. <laughs> It is getting late in the day. <laughs> one, is, one of them is 0.04% and the other one is 78%. <laughs> How many people think that the carbon is limiting? <laughs> a bit slow there. 0.04% and 0.78% and 78%. The carbon is limiting, right? The nitrogen is not limiting. 78% of the atmosphere is nitrogen. Okay. The carbon is the limiting factor. We're putting nitrogen on by the tonne, but it's the carbon that's limiting. And the reason that we haven't really been getting that is because the way we've been taught to view soil is like this, which some of you have seen me talk about this before. But we think of, because soil is under everything that we're growing in, it's under our feet, it's under our crops and pastures, and um, we think of an ecosystem that's arranged like this with, well, it is, I guess, arranged like that with soil at the bottom and then the plants and then the animals, but it actually doesn't function in that way. And the problem with thinking of it like that, and you'll see it in textbooks like that, is that when the soil isn't working as, or if our plants aren't working or growing as we'd like them to, or animals aren't producing as we'd like them to do, we immediately think there's something wrong with the soil. We send the soil off to the labor laboratory and expose it to all kinds of awful chemicals that they use there. I just think it's really cruel to dig up your soil and send it off to the lab where they extract it with all these ghastly carcinogenic extractants and then go, oh, you haven't got enough nitrogen. That's why you've got a problem. You need to go and put some on. Well, it actually doesn't work like that. And those of you who have heard me talk before know that. Um, that in actual fact, as I said before, it's plants that are going to, through the process of photosynthesize, they're going to turn weathered rock minerals into fertile topsoil. So it's actually photosynthesis, not soil, that forms the base of the pyramid of life. And we have to think about it like this, that we have photosynthesis at the base, and when we have that working really well, the roots of those plants and the microbes living around the roots of those plants are, together with the plants, going to build fertile topsoil. And if we're not concentrating on getting this bit right, we can never really get that bit right unless we want to keep going out and buying stuff in a bag and putting it on. And as long as we keep on doing that, we're going to have so many imbalances, not only in our soil, but in our plants, in our animals, in the people consuming that food and in our wider environment. We have to uh, change that paradigm, start thinking about photosynthesis and things will come right. So optimising photosynthesis, um, I haven't got much time, so I'm not going to go into that in a great deal of detail, but how many of you use a refractometer? Put your hand up to measure bricks. Oh, lovely. That's lovely. You know, sometimes, uh, just recently, some of the workshops I've done, I've started talking about refractometers and bricks, and there hasn't been a single person in the room put their hand up. And in fact, they've had no idea what bricks, bricks was. Um, so you're measuring, basically, you're measuring how fast that plant is photosynthesizing, because if it has high levels of sugar, if you get a nice fuzzy line and you've got high levels of minerals, you know that the sugar is actually going down into the soil where it needs to go, stimulating the soil microbiome, and that those uh, workers in the soil are uh, making available all of the nutrition that your plant needs, 
including fixing atmospheric nitrogen. So that's another reason that we want lots of carbon exuding into the soil, forming aggregates and improving soil structure so that we have well aerated soil so that that 78% nitrogen can get right down around plant roots so that the bacteria are able to fix it and convert it into a form that plants can use. Uh, just not sure why this is not changing. Ah, oh, okay. Um, so very, very quickly, how does the carbon and the nitrogen end up being combined together to form a polymer that's organic carbon and organic nitrogen? Well, it's microbes that do that. Again, we haven't got much time today, so I'm not going to go into a huge amount of detail about how that happens. But this wheat plant on the right, this, this guy here, there's the seed. Um, it's been, it's had 100 kilos per hectare or say 100 pounds per acre of high analysis fertilizer put under the seed. And it's formed a very short root system with clean roots and it's basically not building soil, not communicating um, with the soil, with the soil microbes. And the plant more or less has to exist on the fertilizer that was put underneath that seed. These two plants here have been grown in a biological system where they've had to find their own food and they've produced a, a good root system. They've got lots of soil sticking to the roots. Um, and what is going on inside one of these these little lumps, say this one here. What's going on inside those macro aggregates that are forming around those plant roots? This slide takes a little while to load because it's a big slide. Some, of, If you were here yesterday, you've already seen this slide. It's also on my website. Um, there is a paper called Nitrogen, the Double-Edged Sword on my website, which is amazingcarbon.com. This is a macro aggregate. This is one of these little lumps on a plant root. The blue indicates moisture. So it's moister on the inside than it is on the outside. And it does sort of have a bit of a membrane on it in a way. It manages to uh, seal out some of the oxygen because we want a relatively low partial pressure of oxygen inside an aggregate. The enzyme that uh, these little yellow ellipses here are, are colonies of nitrogen fixing bacteria. They're all feeding on the sugars that are coming out of that plant root and they need a low partial pressure of oxygen in order for nitrogen reductase to work. It's not possible to fix nitrogen in the presence of too much oxygen, which is why I'm sure you're all familiar with the nodules on the roots of legumes, that it's like it's a, a protected environment, sort of you've got that membrane that seals, keeps out the oxygen, keeps in the sugars, keeps in the moisture, and provides a little, makes a little factory really, where the, not the uh, bacteria that are living in there and feeding on the sugars that are coming out of the legume roots are able to fix atmospheric nitrogen and convert it into a form that the plant can use. Plants can't take nitrogen directly from the air. They ha it has to go through this microbial intermediary. So what, what you see happening inside the nodules on legume roots is also happening inside aggregates that are attached to plant roots of any kind of plant uh, and also happening inside riser sheaths. And I'll show you some examples of riser sheaths later. Um, the other thing that's happening here is that a lot of that energy that's coming out of the plant root is going into these into the hyphae of mycorrhizal fungi, which uh, I talked about in greater detail yesterday. And they produce sick, sticky substances that help to pull all those soil particles together and actually form those aggregates. So the, the fungi are very important for actually creating the microsite in the soil where nitrogen fixing can take place. And then the bacteria inside that aggregate are doing the nitrogen fixing as well as there are also uh, phos there are phosphorus solubilizing bacteria in there and other bacteria that make sulfur available. Now, why is that important? That's important because we need to have carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus and sulfur to form humus, which is a polymer of organic carbon, which is highly stable, has high cation exchange capacity, is incredibly important for soil structure, water holding capacity, and the fertility of your soils. It's about 60% carbon, 6 to 8% nitrogen, 1 to 2% phosphorus, and 0.8 to 1.5% sulfur. Why do those things seem so specific? Well, nobody is really sure, but it doesn't matter where in the world you go, what kind of soil it is, what kind of environment it is, what the climate is whether it's in a forest, whether it's in a grassland, it doesn't matter what kind of plants they were, but humus always has those four elements in that same ratio. 
I guess it's just like our bones have probably got minerals in a certain ratio and it wouldn't matter where where we were living or what we were eating, they'll probably be the same. I'm not sure. I just pulled that out. That's, I don't know whether that's correct. I might have to go home and check that. Um, but anyway, I can tell you that humus always has that ratio. And if you add those things together, they come to about 70% which means, well, what's the other 30%? Well, the other 30% is minerals in the soil. It is actually an organomineral complex. It's formed within the soil matrix, and it is part of the soil. It's a polymerization process where simple carbon compounds are joined together into much larger ones, and a whole lot of other elements are joined in. And it's, in some ways, it's a little bit like the lignification process that takes place in a tree. So you have a tree with green leaves. It's photosynthesizing fixing carbon, making sugars, and then within the tree, those carbon compounds, those short-chain carbon compounds are being linked together to form much longer-chain carbon compounds like lignin, which is wood. Now, once you have wood, it is either wood or it isn't wood. Okay, You can't extract wood from wood, can you? You can extract tannic acids and other things, but it's it's... It's either, like I said, it's either wood or it isn't. Now, with humus, it is either humus or it isn't. When it's humus, it's part of the soil matrix. You can't extract it, which is one of the reasons that we know so little about it. Once you've extracted it and you've separated it from those minerals or made it into humic acid or fulvic acid or humans or something else that you've taken from that, it is no longer the original humus and it no longer has the same properties. Sure, humic and fulvic acids have beneficial properties, but they are not humus and they don't behave the same way as humus. You could extract tannic acid from wood, for example, and it is not wood and it doesn't behave like wood. It's, a, it's an extract of wood. So the things that are, are sold, and some of them highly beneficial, I'm sure, that are, are called humic compounds actually are not the same thing as humus, and humus can only form in soil because it needs to have those minerals with it. Now, those minerals are generally iron and aluminium, which are very common minerals in most soils. So that when you have the humification process proceeding, going ahead, it is extracting available aluminium out of the soil solution. Aluminium is very toxic to plant roots. We don't want to have high levels of available aluminium in our soils. So when soil is forming and building, it's taking aluminium out, sequestering it in that humic molecule, which is fantastic. When our soils are degrading, as most of them in the world are, they're releasing that aluminium, which then becomes available for plant uptake. And we, most of us, have much higher levels of aluminium in our bodies than we should. And often it's just a result of soil degradation and aluminium being made available by the breakdown of humic molecules. It's been implicated in Alzheimer's. People with Alzheimer's have high circulating levels of aluminium in their, in their blood. Anyway, that's getting right off the track. Uh, the point was that you can't form humus unless you've got microbes in the soil that are fixing nitrogen. If you add nitrogen, like inorganic nitrogen, from outside of that humic molecule or outside of those macroaggregates or rhizosheaths, it has completely the opposite effect because when you just add inorganic nitrogen, it doesn't have a carbon source with it and the microbes that it, the bacteria specifically, that it activates and stimulates they want to reproduce, they want to multiply, they will look for carbon to make their bodies from because their bodies are made from a combination of carbon and nitrogen. They will actually break down the carbon compounds in the soil to release that carbon to grow, to build from. So adding inorganic nitrogen has the opposite effect. When nitrogen is fixed biologically, that's how you can build humus. Yeah? Sorry, English is a second language for me. Could you just repeat that? <laughs> uh, okay, if there if it's something like a protein hydrolysate or protein emulsions or something with amino fish, um, fish hydrolysate, fish emulsion, some of those kinds of things that are really great sources of amino acids and proteins, then I, they're, they're great because they're not going to interfere with this process at all. 
I'm, I'm a great fan of those things. I'm just not quite sure about some of the other. But they're proteins, aren't they? You're talking about soybean and that sort of thing. You're talking about proteins. I'm not sure about chicken manure because I think that I think the nitrogen is inorganic, isn't it? I don't know. So we don't. We tend to. I always get that question when I. I always get asked that question. I knew people were going to talk about manure <laughs> uh, because we don't actually use those things in Australia, or if we do, it's only like very um, because of the fact that you've got big industrialised, you know, farm factories like with, with your beef and, and chickens and pigs and all that sort of thing, there is a lot of manure here and the, and the fact that the dairies are uh, like grain-fed uh, housed animals, you know, like I was really shocked the first time I came to the United States and realised that a dairy didn't mean pasture, that it actually meant that cows were all in the shed getting fed something because we don't see that. So um, I, I'm, I really can't answer the question about manure, I should check that. But I think you probably do have to be careful that you, I'm pretty sure it's got a lot of inorganic nitrogen in it. So maybe somebody knows how much inorganic nitrogen and organic nitrogen are in, in um, chicken manure, like as a percentage. You'd have to actually get it analysed by a lab and just see how much inorganic nitrogen is in there. I know some people compost it to try and um, take the heat out of it and to try and reduce the amounts of inorganic nitrogen. But I'm sorry, I can't really answer that. Uh, I will look into it though because I should have known before I came here that someone was going to ask me that. How about the vegetable meals? I think they'd be all right, Julie. But again, you'd have to get a lab analysis. Just find out what they're made of. And, you know, the things that you don't want a lot of is nitrate and ammonium. And if you're going to have to have one of those, I'd choose ammonium over nitrate every time because nitrate is carcinogenic. We shouldn't have any nitrate in our soils, in our foods, in our water. It's, it's not, it, like in water, nitrate's carcinogenic at two parts per million and most countries around the world just cannot meet that standard. I'm not sure what your standard here is. I think it's something like 20. Like you're allowed to have 20 parts per million of nitrate. It's 10, is it? Thank you. <laughs> um, in some parts of Australia, it's 50. <laughs> okay. Right, so how are we going to at access atmospheric nitrogen? Well, we need to have these free living and associative nitrogen fixing bacteria um, within aggregates or within riser sheaths and somewhere around plant roots where they can get the energy that they need and they're going to be using liquid carbon as their sole energy source. So what does a riser sheath look like? A riser sheath is basically just a column of soil that's around a plant root and you can, you can uh, pull them off um, just very gently, just slide them off. They just come off looking like a, like a straw, you know, like a hollow straw. And it's because it's all the exudates that are coming out of roots and then the, uh, the bacteria and the fungi that are feeding on those that are producing sticky substances and pulling all the soil particles together. And it's, it's a self-organising principle. I mean, it's really amazing how microbes in the soil that probably have very, very tiny brains, if they have them at all. I don't think they do have brains, do they? How do they know how to do this? I mean, in a way, they're forming like a biofilm. They're actually, stop laughing, Julie. They're pulling all the, um, this is serious. Like, you know, this is really important. Like, you know, we're not, we're not very good at organising ourselves. These little tiny things that we can't even see in the soil, they're organised enough to form a riser sheath ar around that, those roots They've created a little factory in there where they can then quite happily fix atmospheric nitrogen um, as much as that plant needs. But if you pull out a plant that's got clean roots, I'm going to show you some photos of that in a minute. Well, that's not going to be happening. So this is healthy, seeing that. Uh, this is healthy, My macro aggregates around plant roots. That's healthy. So what do plant roots, how do they respond when we add inorganic in? Sada still here? Was she gone? Okay. Sada from Finland, who was here, she had, she's had to catch a plane this afternoon, so she's gone. But these photos were actually taken from her farm in Finland earlier this year, and it was, it was really an interesting insight for me because it was something I've never seen before. Uh, I showed you that photograph before, so we know this has always been one of my favourite photos. You know that when we add, if we put inorganic fertiliser under the seed, we're going to get these really short dysfunctional root systems. Um, I was already aware of that and also I know when you see clean white roots like that, you know, there is nothing happening. That plant is not communicating with soil microbes and they're just, 
they're disorganised. <laughs> they're not forming riser sheaths and, and aggregates. They've, they're in total disarray because of uh, inorganic fertiliser. And this poor little plant here, or plants I should say, um, we've got cereal grains with fungicide on them and totally clean roots coming out and not talking to one single bacteria by the look of it. And the soil is like totally, I mean, there's no aggregation there, totally structureless soil, um, which is what we see all the time in farming areas where um, excessive nitrogen is being used and then all the other things, fungicides, insecticides, etc. So, um, it's organic because urea, which is why it's called urine, is actually an organic compound. It's got carbon in it. By definition, it's... But what happens is that as soon as urea hits the soil, microbes um, activate it and convert it into uh, ammonium and, or ammonia actually, which usually volatilizes, and nitrate, which leaches. So if, it's, if the soil's wet, that will leach through to, to, uh, to groundwater or runoff, in surface runoff, um, and the ammonia, which is the gas, volatilizes. So it, it very rapidly decomposes into several inorganic nitrogen compounds, but urea itself is actually organic. It's just that it's, it's an unstable form. If you add them to, to urea, to urine, I can't answer that question. I don't know. I'll, I'll find out for you. <laughs> uh, so this is, what, this is what we saw in Finland earlier this year. Um, you might, those of you who've talked to Sarah while she's been here will recognise her from this photo, um, and her husband Ilka, and they had 20 different organic amendments. They're, this is an organic farm, and they were just trying a whole lot of different organic amendments uh, to see what happened, and, and just growing wheat. It was a great trial. It was all fully replicated and everything. So we were digging wheat plants out, looking at their roots, and there was just this pattern was coming up every time, every single... It didn't matter what the organic amendment was, what we saw was that the roots near the top had beautiful riser sheaths on them, dreadlocks, I call them, when the roots look like dreadlocks. Or, it's fantastic. And then down the bottom, they were as clean, as clean, as, which is not healthy. All these unhealthy roots down the bottom and all these ones up here had dreadlocks. And we looked in every single one of these 20 different organic and clean, beautiful riser sheaths up here. And... It didn't matter whether it was pig slurry or whether it was um, some kind of forest product waste or whatever. We, we're seeing the same thing. There's the seed, perfectly clean. I'm not pulling the dirt off those roots. We were very carefully digging them out, shaking them, and the, below the seed, the roots were clean. So I'm just going like, oh, I don't get this. I've never seen this before. This is an organic trial. How can this be happening? Anyway, we went back to have lunch and we're still on the farm. And then I just said to Sarah, you know, it's like you put some kind of poison or something under those seeds. I mean, what, what could you have possibly put if it's just all organic and all organic amendments? And I said, you didn't put any nitrogen in that trial, did you? And she said, oh, yes, of course we did, because we had a scientist from the university who was advising us and they set the whole thing up. And they said that because the different organic amendments that we were using had different amounts of nitrogen in them, like naturally, some were naturally higher in nitrogen than others, that we needed to just put a base level of nitrogen across the whole trial so that we then were just looking at what the organic amendments themselves were doing and taking nitrogen out, out of the picture. So they had put 80 kilograms per hectare of nitrogen directly under the seed, like as it was sown, the nitrogen was dropped down and then the seed dropped on top, um, as you do when you're farming, and then the soil covered over the top of it. So 80 kilos per hectare is 80 pounds per acre, basically. So these poor little uh, wheat plants all had 80 pounds per acre of nitrogen placed directly below the seed. And look what it did to those plant roots. Now, the interesting thing that came out of that was that Sarah said, you know, if we hadn't made that mistake, we never would have seen this. Like, we do learn more from our mistakes in, in farming and in life, don't we? And it was the most dramatic example I've seen. Look at these beautiful, healthy roots up here and, uh, and what's happened under that seed was the result of nitrogen. So I said, well, I'm, 
if I wasn't convinced before, I'm totally convinced now. Um, and what we're seeing there basically is that the, the roots above where the nitrogen's been added, we've got plenty of, we've got a really healthy soil microbiome there. We've got nitrogen fixing going on and all the things that we, we want microbes to do in the soil. And below that, there's just no microbial activity. The microbes matter. And of course, because they've become so important and um, everybody's talking about them these days, Monsanto has jumped into the, into the fray. And this is actually from the Monsanto website, uh, their bioag website. Get this, the plant microbiome using biodiversity to grow more. Monsanto said that. Um, and then they've got you know, a diagram of all these different uh, microbes in the rhizosphere, um, a, a description of what the rhizosphere is and how many microbes live there. But of course, what Monsanto are doing are taking microbes from the rhizosphere, genetically engineering them, trying to make a strain that will, or an ecotype that's going to fix nitrogen faster than the ones that live there naturally. And then they're going to patent that and then they're going to sell it back to you uh, at a huge price and tell you, we, in fact, it's all, there's already scientific articles coming out on it. Wow, we've found a bacteria that can fix nitrogen. You won't need to use nitrogen fertilizer anymore. And the interesting thing about these articles that are coming out is that in the introductory paragraphs, they have actually started to say how bad inorganic nitrogen actually is for your soil and your plants and your animals and the wider environment. So they've criticised everything that's been pushed um, for decades. And now we have a new butte bug in a jug that we're going to sell to you. Well, folks, you have all the nitrogen fixing bacteria that you need in your soils and you just need to provide a home for them and some food for them and they'll be fine. Um, what worries me is that somewhere down the track, Monsanto's going to come onto your place and go, oh, we found nitrogen-fixing bacteria in your soil. They're, they're ours, and uh, sue you for it. <laughs> so, um, so in actual fact, of all the microbes that are important to this whole humification process, and what we want is to get more inorganic nitrogen. We want to increase the stores of inor oh, sorry, organic nitrogen in our soil because organic nitrogen can't volatilise, it can't leach, um, it's, and it's absolutely non-toxic. So it's totally opposite to, to inorganic nitrogen. We want to have more of it. And even though we've been talking about bacteria that fix nitrogen, mycorrhizal fungi are very, very important to the whole process of increasing the amount of organic nitrogen in our soils because they're the ecosystem engineers that actually enable this whole process to happen. Nothing in the soil ever happens in isolation. Everything's connected to everything else as it is everywhere else in life. And um, it, it's no different when it comes to soil. So I showed this diagram yesterday for those of you who saw it. You've got plant tops, plant roots, and then the yellow bits are hyphae of mycorrhizal fungi, uh, hugely extending the root network and the plant's ability to extract water and nutrients from the soil. Um, but this is the photo that's the the interesting one, I think, when it comes to aggregate formation, we've got a plant root here, or a plant root tip, I suppose, or a root hair even, and then just all these hyphae of mycorrhizal fungi coming out of that plant root. That's what you call a well-colonised plant root. And when they're well-colonised like that, um, you can just imagine why the soil sticks so well around that. And that, that's those hyphae are producing sticky substances um, and also that's a photo that's taken like in a, in a petri dish, in a living culture or on a petri dish in a laboratory. Um, but in the soil, they're not just going to be in one single plane like that. They're going to be pointing out in all directions. They sort of look a bit like uh, bottle washers or something. You know, those things you wash, wash bottles with. They stick out everywhere. They look really quite funny, actually, when you see the photos in the soil. And, um, and because they're sticking out in all directions and pulling soil particles in, that's they can pull together the soil particles to make those macro aggregates. So it's the engineering is, that's as important as the chemistry that's taking place within that aggregate. And mycorrhizal fungi are really, really important to that for that process. Now, that, the irony is mycorrhizal fungi are incredibly inhibited by nitrogen fertiliser. So that if you're applying inorganic nitrogen fertiliser, you're actually knocking out these guys that are able to pull soil particles together and form the aggregates that you need for 
nitrogen to be fixed. You have to create that microenvironment. It can't be fixed just anywhere in the soil. So as you start to see this picture now of everything that we do when we're applying inorganic nitrogen is going to be counterproductive in terms of actually having the natural... We stop the natural process from happening. And that's why we don't see the natural process in conventionally farmed soils. That's why scientists aren't finding this because they're not looking in the right places. They're actually looking in places where everything we are doing, if we're cultivating, if we're spraying, uh, and if we're using some kind of inorganic nitrogen or phosphorus fertiliser, we'll do exactly the same thing. We'll actually inhibit mycorrhizal fungi and prevent soil aggregation. Uh, so how do we go about... I've got 15 minutes left, I think, haven't we? Supporting beneficial microbes. Well, I think it's going to be pretty obvious that uh, living ground cover is going to be important. That's not going to happen there. Um, you know, multi-species cover crops, we've been talking about that for two days. Yep. Okay, so that was a good question, Jonathan. It's John. John, isn't it? Yeah. Um, do I recommend inoculating with mycorrhizal fungi. Uh, in, a, in a situation like that, if it's been highly disturbed or sometimes like in potato farming where it's been like really tilled up and then healed up and there's not much opportunity for mycorrhizal fungi to colonise, then we have seen advantages from colonisation. But generally, if it was in your, in your vegetable garden at home or something, um, no. You can try it. I mean, that's always the best way to find out whether something works or not. Just try it on a small scale. But most people that have tried it have found very little, if any, response, unless the soil has been really highly disturbed. And it's probably a bit like a probiotic in that we now know that probiotics generally don't even make it into the colon. You know that they're not getting through our stomach acids. I mean, it, you may have millions of, of bacteria in the capsule or something that you take, but it's not actually doing anything. So you could, you could be applying mycorrhizal fungi to your seeds and things, but whether or not the soil is full of trillions of different kinds of bacteria and fungi, and as a general rule, anything that you apply is probably going to last about two seconds. You know, and unless you're applying it to an environment where there's really not much bacteria there or not much fungi there. So if there's no competition there, they've got a, a chance to survive, like a really degraded environment. But if it's not a really degraded environment, there's going to be lots of other bacteria and fungi that are just going to feast on them and they're just going to be gone. Well, I mean, it's amazing really how resilient mycorrhizal fungi are because they produce spores, tiny little spores in the soil when they, you know, they become dormant and produce spores. And even though these sorts of soils have been farmed like this for decades, there still will be mycorrhizal fungi in there. Luckily for us, they're one of the most resilient um, life forms in soil. They're incredibly important to plants and they are amazingly resilient. Sometimes an inoculum, like for mine sites, rehabilitation of mine sites where they've brought subsoil up that's never actually ever been topsoil and doesn't have mycorrhizal fungi in it, soil, uh, sand that's been dredged out of estuaries that's been underwater for decades, and they form sand dunes and try to grow plants. The plants will not grow in that sand unless they inoculate them with mycorrhizal fungi. And some situations where the soil is really heavily disturbed, like potato farming and that sort of thing, you will see a response. But as a general rule, no. So I would try a whole lot of other things before. I mean, you're like cover crops, for example, you know, are going to have a huge effect because you've got photosynthesis, you're supporting the soil microbiome. I grow giant pumpkins in a hobby. I grew a field for resilience. This is what they said. They had a lot of microbes on there. And what I did is I just cut them down, left the roots and everything in the ground, and just rolled it through that much up. So when I do next year, that next year, I'm gonna, so I do. I use my horizon. I go to the extreme. But having the zinnias was the prettiest garden I ever had. With them all coming up, didn't really enough. I got all the seeds I want from 10 years or whatever from the flowers, right? And I got all the micros that are, that are Okay, so for those down the back that didn't hear that, is it Joe? Is that your, yes. on your name tag? Joe just said he planted a field full of zinnias because they're mycorrhizal and it was the prettiest field that he's yeah, ever seen cool. and just mow them down and then rototilled it just like really shallow. Shadow, shallow rototilling is not going to do much damage. Right. I mean, I know that there's this, been this big emphasis to no-till, but, you know, if I had a choice between shallow rototilling, <laughs> if 
have to say that carefully, shallow roto tilling or, um, or using glyphosate. Well, I'm going to choose shallow roto tilling. <laughs> But, but the thing is that the more you change your soil by doing things like that, the more plants that you have there and the more robust that soil microbiome becomes, the less weeds you're going to have anyway because they're a symptom of unbalanced soils and dysfunctional soils. So you will have less weeds if you get and more different kinds of plants you can have. And I'm so pleased that you mentioned that about the zinnias because I just love the flowers. And I want to be able to drive through the countryside and instead of seeing uh, this... You know, I want to see fields of flowers. Yeah, it's all green. It's, all green. Yeah, not, it, yeah, but not just green, but flowers. Not because, the yeah. The tongue was picking it around. <laughs> I couldn't get pretty real. And when I cut them down, I didn't want to have to see them for the next year. So I cut them off and moved them to my other patch. So next year I'll have them with that patch and put my pumpkins here this year. Oh, that's just beautiful. I love that. That's a beautiful story. Because um, uh, the thing is, when you've got the flowers... We, we've also got pollinators, we've got predatory insects, we're creating habitat for a whole lot of other life forms. When you've got flowers in your mix, you could, you, you could make your mix all flowers. You don't have to, you could just be all different kinds of flowers in there. And then you've got your insects, your predatory insects. You, you're creating above ground ecosystems as well as below ground insects. I'm all for fields of flowers. I just think that's wonderful. <laughs> we should all just go home now. I don't need to tell you anymore. Fields of flowers, that's all you have to remember from today. Um, so this one's got, um, I think the radish is flowering there, or there might be buckwheat, I'm not quite sure, I can't see. But, but that will be flowers when the sunflowers flower. Um, and again, you know, no-till. Like, it's promoted as the holy grail, but there's probably been 38 different chemicals go onto that, and there's nothing living in there. Um, this is a technique we use in Australia where we just let the grasses grow, in our, uh, instead of spraying them out, they're spraying them out because they don't want these grasses. These are volunteer native grasses that just come into our, our areas if it's not cultivated. Well, what on earth is wrong with that? Those grasses grow over summer. Um, sorry, our, our agricultural production systems are quite different to yours. We can grow plants more or less at any time of the year, but we tend to grow all of our, most of our crops in winter time. So all of our cereals and canola and those kinds of things are grown in our winter because um, it's probably a little bit warmer in our winter, I'd suggest, than it is in your winter here. And then it becomes too hot for that, those C3, those cool season plants in summertime. In some areas, there's enough rainfall to grow uh, corn and sorghum and um, sunflowers, but in many areas, there's not enough rainfall. But you will get these volunteer grasses, which they only grow in summertime. So why on earth spray them out? Because when you get the first frost, at the beginning of winter, they're all going to be dormant anyway, and they've photosynthesized all summer and created uh, topsoil. And I'm going to give you an ex and built nitrogen. So I'm just going to give you an example of this couple. They've become quite famous. If you Google them, you'll probably find articles that have been written about them. Ian and Diane Haggerty at Wild Catchem in Western Australia. Um, this is really the basket case of Australian agriculture. Western Australia is mostly sand plain. Uh, there's 6 million hectares of wheat grown into sand plain country, and this is what it looks like over summer. It's a Mediterranean climate like Southern California. Uh, it doesn't rain at all over summer, or very little over summer. Um, they have very low wheat yields, and that's the stubble, the residue that's left behind from a, from a winter wheat crop, and that's their neighbour. This is not the Haggerty's place. That's their neighbour. But the Haggerty said, well, you have to spray it three times to, to keep it bare like that. And the official advice that's given to farmers by the universities, the Department of Agriculture, CSIRO, which is our national research organisation, is you must not let anything green grow uh, between your two wheat crops, like in that fallow period. Do not let anything green grow because it will carry disease from one crop period to another. It will use all of the water. Um, mind you, any water that falls over summer is never going to make it to the next winter anyway, so you might as well use it. Um, and it's going to just extract all these nutrients and, and reduce soil fertility. So it's going to take the moisture, it's going to take the fertility, and it's going to carry over disease. And they are so strong about that that farmers are not prepared to break out of that. There's so much peer pressure to... This is regarded as best management practice. If your neighbour's driving past and they see one green plant in there, they'll be on the phone. You know, we saw some weeds in your fallow. You've got to keep it clean. And there's green alerts go out. If it rains over summertime, there's a green alert goes around to all the farmers to get your spray rigs out, get out there and spray your pastures because if you're not keeping the weeds out of your 
what they call weeds, which are these lovely little native grasses. If you're not keeping them out of your paddocks, you're um, doing us all a disservice. Well, the Haggerty's decided they're going to let their weeds grow. These are native warm season, annual warm season grasses. And no one will speak to them when they go into town. Uh, poor Diane, she goes into the supermarket and someone will see her coming up the aisle and they'll turn around and walk back the other way. They have, they have had so much peer pressure and hate mail, all kinds of things, because this is regarded as just absolutely sloppy, messy, like, you know, it's like if someone let their lawn grow this big and you'd have all the neighbours saying, you know, go and mow your lawn. Um, <laughs> it, it's just not, they're just not fitting with the community norms. Well, the Wheat Belt NRM, which is a natural resource management group that um, kind of provides educational materials and whatever for wheat belt farmers, decided to do a survey and measure the carbon levels on 50 farms in the wheat belt. And it was just random. Luckily, they included the Haggerty's in their, uh, in their trial, in their survey. Oh, something. Okay, I've jumped. <laughs> Shouldn't have changed this at lunchtime. <laughs> okay, I'm going to get to that in a minute. I just wanted to show you the riser sheaths that happen. So they've got, um, that's the neighbour. This is Haggerty's over summer. When Haggerty's plant their wheat in winter time, these are the riser sheaths on their wheat, just to give you an idea of how healthy their, their plants are. This is a, just in case you're not sure what you're looking at, there's a wheat seed there. That's a coleoptile. It's just starting to germinate. These are the roots. Um, Seeds always produce roots before they produce tops because they need to find moisture and they need to get some nutrients before they can actually start to grow leaves. And then when they photosynthesize, then they grow more roots and so it goes. You cannot see these roots. And even when the plant's got quite a few leaves, um, like the roots are so thick that the soil just comes up in these great big, you know, clusters, like, like it really is dreadlocks. It's just amazing um, how much soil sticks around those roots. So I just wanted to give you that information to let you know that as a result of them having something green all year round, their mycorrhizal levels and their bacterial levels in their soils are just amazing. And um, these bacteria know what they're doing. They're self-organised and they've formed riser sheaths. When they're forming riser sheaths like that, they're fixing nitrogen. Uh, the Haggerty's don't use any nitrogen at all. And this is a close-up of what it looks like, that soil around the roots. It's got all these little hyphae of mycorrhizal fungi and you can actually see like little globs of sticky stuff like exudates coming out of plant roots and they're just pulling all that sand together um, and aggregating it. Tim this morning was talking about um, how well the sand was being aggregated by having life in the soil. You can actually pull sand together into little lumps and turn it into fertile topsoil if you've got the macro aggregate, the Sorry, micro. Magnifies that picture? 300 times 300. So this is what I what I meant to tell you. So these soil samples were collected and analysed by independent, an independent soil scientist that the Wheatbuild NRM had employed, and they were using national soil carbon research program protocols, which has been developed by our national research organisation, the CSIRO. They had five replicates. So in other words, they repeated everything five times, and they went to three depths. So when they were uh, taking the samples, they took uh, first four inches, which is 10 centimetres, and then the next four inches, which is takes you down to 20 centimetres and then the next four inches which takes you down to 30 centimetres. So every hole that they dug, um, they separated the soil into three increments and they repeated that um, five times on the Haggerty's place and on their neighbour's place and what they found is that all of the differences between the Haggerty's and their neighbours were statistically significant, which is not surprising when you look at the size of the numbers. The percentage increase compared to their neighbours, the Haggerty's have 41.5% more soil carbon. Absolutely mind-blowing. They have nearly 30% more soil nitrogen. They don't use any. Their water holding capacity, soil water holding capacity, has increased 13%, despite the fact that all the experts said, if you have green plants over summer, they're going to use up all your water. All right. So what do the experts say when they saw this? We must have made a terrible mistake in the lab. These results can't possibly be right. If anybody wants the raw data, I have it. There are just hundreds of measurements in there, like every single increment for every single one of those replicates, and they've just measured it all to the nth degree. How they could say that the lab made a mistake, I don't know. And you only have to go and dig in the, sp in the soil with a spade, and you can see that it's like chalk and cheese on one side of the fence to the other. <laughs> 
No, the neighbours never do. Ask Gabe. You know, any of the innovate, ask any of the innovators what their neighbours uh, think, and there is not one single innovator that I'm aware of that their neighbours are doing what they do, because you're actually criticising your neighbour in a way by outperforming them. You're, what you're saying is you're a lousy farmer and I'm a really good farmer, but but they think everyone thinks the Haggertys are are crazy. Uh, if, if any of you attended Tim's talk uh, today, he was saying that when he had a multi-species cover crop sort of grew this high, that the neighbours were just like, why have you got all those weeds? Like, you, you just got to be totally around the twist. Why would you want to have all those weeds? You know, not understanding that you're actually building soil. And that's one of the problems is that people think this is messy, this is untidy, this is not, you know, that things should be kept or short and clean or, or, or have no plants there at all or we've just got this kind of a bit of a cleanliness ethic that goes against what we really need to be doing in agriculture, I think. I actually like the appearance of, of uh, messy. <laughs> um, but, but I mean, you know, yeah, zinnias. I love zinnias. <laughs> so if we look at the different increments, so you're going to have to uh, bear with me with metric, I'm sorry, but this is four inches, top four inches and then four to eight inches and eight to 12 inches. When we look at the percentage increase in the carbon at those depths, like say 37% there, 41% there, 54% there, as you go deeper, the increase in the carbon is getting more and more and more. So that's always a really good indicator that's coming from the roots. It's not something, it's not surface carbon that's forming from crop residues or anything. Um, it's a uh, it's actually that liquid carbon pathway. But I'm not talking about carbon really today, except for the fact that carbon and nitrogen always go together. If you're increasing soil carbon, you're increasing organic nitrogen, and they have increased their organic nitrogen by 800 kilograms per hectare or 800 pounds per acre. Same thing. 800 pounds per acre of nitrogen that's all just been sucked in from the atmosphere combined with carbon, it's in a stable form in their soil. When they do a soil test, according to the protocols or the criteria that the lab uses, they don't have enough available nitrogen. Available nitrogen, according to a soil test, is going to be either ammonium or nitrate. They don't have enough available nitrogen to grow a crop. When they do a tissue test, their nitrogen levels or their protein levels in their plant tissues and their grain is like absolutely optimum. And no one else in Western Australia has been able to get optimum levels of those proteins in their plant leaves or their, their grain. When they take the grain to the, the silo, to the receival depot, they always, you know, they look at it and say, oh, where did you grow this? Like, this doesn't look like Western Australian grain. It's plump, it's heavy. And the other thing is in the trucks that carry the grain from the farm, they farm 10,000, well, they were farming 10,000 hectares, which is like 25,000 acres. Uh, just recently, she told me that they're now up to 12,000, so that's more than 25,000. I can't do the sums on that. It, they're farming a big area, right? So they have all these trucks that are taking their grain to the silos. And you ha generally on those big grain trucks, you have a line, you fill it to that line because that will be a certain weight, like 50 tonnes or something rather like that. Well, then they got pulled up, you know, by the police or whoever regulates these things and they have to, you have to go over a weigh bridge and check the weight. Well, it was way overweight. And they said, but well, we filled it to the line. Well, it's way overweight because the nutrient density is really high. It's the, um, you know, it's, you're, you're really, so these, when I was talking before about, or we can add nitrogen, we can grow more grass, but it doesn't show up in the vat as extra milk. But when we grow more grain, we get paid for the, for the weight. And people think that, that they're getting more, but they're not unless it's nutrient dense. In this case, they are building really nutrient dense grain. And they're trying to get segregation of not only their grain, but other farmers that are doing the same thing. So it's not going to be certified organic, but it's going to be whatever label they decide to use regeneratively grown or nutrient dense or something, but it has to be segregated at the silo because at the moment it just goes in with all the other grain. But people want it, like overseas buyers, nearly all of our wheat goes overseas. People do want uh, this high quality grain. So provided they can get the infrastructure for, for um, holding it then and start to get a premium for paying it, uh, for growing it, 
sorry, it's getting a bit late in the day. If they can get a premium for this grain, which is much, much better quality, then it might encourage more farmers to do the same thing. Their input costs are minimal compared to other farmers. They're not using any insecticide. They're not using any fungicide. They're not using any nitrogen fertiliser. So what are they doing? I think on my next slide, okay, here we are. So this is what they have done. They've increased photosynthetic capacity just by letting those green plants grow um, over summer. They, they don't have to plant anything and next, next summer the grasses will come up again. As far as climate allows, some, some summers they have more green than others. And they've increased photosynthetic rate. In other words, the BRICS levels are really high. The BRICS levels on their wheat is up to 28. And Di has actually shown me that, like on the refractometer, she says, Christine, have a look at this. And I, it's very rare that you see BRICS levels up to 28 in wheat because their neighbours are BRICSing around two or three. And I've seen some wheat crops BRICSing down at one or even a half. So they've increased photosynthetic rate. By replacing nitrogen and fertiliser, uh, fertilisers actually use vermi liquid, which is um, from worms. Uh, from worm farms and a compost extract. So they, they buy really top quality compost and they've got a stainless steel extractor. They put it in a little bag and put it in there and I've got no idea what happens after they close the lid. But 20 minutes later, all this tea coloured stuff comes out. Um, but it's like really low volume what they're using because they put that on at five litres per hectare. Um, uh, you probably don't know what five litres per hectare are. Yeah. I, anyway. It's not much. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's about half a litre, so it's ten times that much. Okay, <laughs> ten times that much on a on a two two and a half. So five times that much on an acre. Say, just say five bottles of that on an on an acre. That's all they're putting out. They they put some on the seed. They auger the seed through through it. Um, so there's just like a little bit of seed dressing, which is just vermi liquid and compost extract. Um, and then liquid inject is just where they've just got a big tank on the back of their planter and they're just dripping little little drops of it down the drill lines. Um, and then they'll come across once when uh, the plants are only about this high with a foliar spray of the same stuff and that's all they do. Well, I'm out of time. <laughs> but <laughs> Really? Well, look, feel, feel free to leave. Uh, <laughs> and, and I won't. Yes. Oh, okay. I'm really pleased that you asked that because I did forget to mention one important thing is that is they have sheep, and one of the huge advantages of having something green over summer is that they can double their farm income by having sheep as well as by growing cereals in the winter time. But they, they graze it, and then when when it comes time to sow their crop, it actually does get quite cold. Like they will get frost, even though we don't get snow or anything. At night time, it will go below. They're quite away from the sea, so they're inland, and it does get quite cold at night. It gets hot during the day, but cold at night. The frost just kills those native grasses. That they're a warm, it's a warm season annual grass, a C4 grass. It will be like some farmers have replicated that by growing something like millet over summer and actually letting it seed so it's self seed so they don't have to keep replanting it. And then um, it just is frosted in wintertime. So now they don't have to use any herbicide. And so they've got glyphosate free grain, which is another advantage. Like if they're selling this, it's nutrient dense and it's glyphosate free as well as being insecticide and fungicide free. I think glyphosate free is going to be something that customers, consumers are going to start looking for. So thank you for asking me about the sheep because it's another income stream. Uh, so the question was about the Great Barrier Reef are fish populations dropping as a result of the um, death of the coral. I can't really answer that question except to say that our fisheries are hugely overfished anyway, just from commercial fishing. Um, so fish populations have dropped enormously as just as a result of fishing. Some people have, well, we have already put some marine sanctuaries in to try and create areas where fish can breed. Um, whether or not that's related to the die-off of the coral, I don't, I can't say. I'm sure it must have an effect, because if you take one thing out of an ecosystem, it has to have effects on everything else that, that are there. Okay, so if we're talking about photosynthesis and um, rebuilding soils by having plants, they're obviously grazing management matters. Look, I don't think I need to. I'm sure 
if you haven't got animals, it's probably not relevant to you. And if you have, I'm sure you understand about grazing management. But basically, if plants are small, they're, they're going to have small root systems. You know, if you're just grazing them into the ground all of the time, if they're bigger, they're going to have big root systems. I mean, this is like Goldilocks theory. <laughs> well, you know, and, and the thing is, my rule of thumb is that when you bring animals into a paddock, you should not be able to see their knees. And if you can see their feet at any time, the pasture is too short. So you bring them in when you can't see their knees and once you start to get to think that you can see their feet, you should be t taking them out. So all of that's going to come down to like having multiple paddocks, small paddocks, moving stock frequently, um, all of that. We could spend all day talking about grazing management. But it's really important to have that photosynthetic material there that's green, actively photosynthesising. Um, and as you can see, those animals aren't suffering from... People say, oh, you know, animals can't, um, can't grow when you have... Um, Tall, tall grasses that's got no nutrients in them. Well, it's the top third of the grass that actually has the highest energy content and they love it when it's gone to seed and they get extra protein from the seed and you have healthy animals, healthy soil, building soil. And if, if you don't overgraze pastures too much, I think that might be what my next slide is, they actually do grow faster, a lot faster. So if they're taken down to 90% use, which we quite frequently see, um, it damages the root systems hugely and they take a long time to regrow. So over a 12-month period, you can't grow anywhere near as much as if this was the same plant and you only took 50% of the um, green leaves out at any one graze event. You don't affect the root system in any way so it can keep on growing. You'll get two to three times the biomass in a 12-month period. Well, in our system where we can grow plants all year round. I know I should say in a season. In a season you'll get, in a growing season, whatever it might be, wherever you are in the world, if you only take 50% of the green material out at any one time, um, you'll get two to three times the amount of biomass in that growing season because photosynthetic panels are very important for, for the plant to rebuild itself. Um, that's all been documented in scientific articles and things and as they've come up with this table. This is the percentage of leaf area removed, 10, 20, 30, right down to 90% of the leaf area removed. This is the effect on the root growth up to 50% virtually of leaf removal, there's virtually no effect on the roots of those plants. And once you get over taking 50% out, then you start to have a dramatic effect on plant roots. And I think in most places that I've seen grazed around the world, they've taken well more than 50% out and then they wonder why they start to get pasture decline and problems with the soils. And then they're taking those soil samples and rushing off to the laboratory and wanting to put things onto the soil to um, kill it a little bit more. So this is, a, again, a very, this, this is a photograph that I have tried for years to find the origins of this. So many people have seen it. So many people use it. We know it came from Canada. We know it's Kentucky bluegrass, and that's all we can find about it. Whoever took this photo has maybe passed away or something. It's a very, very old photo. But what it does show um, is that where the plants have been kept short, they're going to have dysfunctional root systems. So these ones were never allowed to grow any taller than that. These ones were allowed just to grow to that height and then kept cut and so on. Look at the, I mean, this is the capacity of these plants to have. If you've got roots going right down to here, then you've got soil building happening right down there. And when you've got soil building happening at depth, then you've got moisture can infiltrate, air can get down there. You've just if you can double the depth of your, the roots on your plants, it's like having twice the amount of land, almost. You can grow so much more biomass and it's going to be so much more productive and you can make so much more efficient use of the rain that falls. I don't think people really are aware of the significance of having very short root systems on plants. It just changes the way your landscape functions, as we've seen very much in parts of California where... Um, there is no longer green over summer where there used to be, and then in wintertime, um, the plants that are there are grazed right into the ground quite often. Uh, so grass grows grass, grass grows soil, um, but we need more than just grass. I was going to talk about diversity, about the importance of diversity, but I think we're... I did talk about it yesterday, and some of you were here yesterday, and some of you were shaking your heads and you're saying you weren't here yesterday. Uh, <laughs> um, do you want me to just keep... Yes, you do. <laughs> okay, roll on. All right, so if we have lots of different kinds of plants, we have a whole lot of different kinds of plant roots and they're all capable of doing different things. Some have got deep tap roots that extract minerals from the subsoil. Others have got fibrous surface roots that are good at uh, extracting nutrients from near the surface. 
But the other thing that's overlooked about this variety of different plants oftentimes has been overlooked is that they're colonised by different sorts of microbes as well, including mycorrhizal fungi. There'll be different species on these different plants and they all interlink and form a huge underground network um, that's called a common mycorrhizal network. And when all those plants are linked underground by one network of mycorrhizal fungi, it has absolutely extraordinary capacity to build, to build soil, to transfer nutrients. And um, this is just a little uh, scientific experiment that's been done. There's more and more scientific articles now coming out on common mycorrhizal networks. This is just showing what happens where you have sorghum and flax growing together, so it's a very limited sort of an environment. The little blue strands here are the hyphae of mycorrhizal fungi that actually join these plants together. So plants can exchange nutrients, exchange water, signal to each other through mycorrhizal networks. But what this uh, work did show was that things in the grass family, like, like sorghum, actually um, they invest a lot of carbon into the soil. These are the soil builders. Your grasses are your soil builders. So green is carbon investment. This is your green here. So they're pumping a whole heap of, this sorghum is pumping a whole heap of carbon into the soil. The arrows that go up are phosphorus uptake and nitrogen uptake. So the yellow and orange arrows. So you can see that the flax plant is actually taking up a whole lot more nutrients it's not putting very much carbon at all into that common mycorrhizal network, but it's uptaking a lot of nutrients. And one of the advantages of having mixtures of grasses and broadleaf plants or herbs or flowers or whatever you want to call them in your pastures is that the nutrient content generally of your broadleaf plants is going to be a lot higher than it is of your grass plants always. Grasses traditionally or always have had are known to have low levels of minerals and trace elements so there's a lot of dangers in just having a grass pasture. Um, one of the advantages of having legumes in there, people think of oh, that animals do better because you're putting legumes in and they're nitrogen fixing. Well, your grasses are fixing nitrogen too. It's just that it hasn't been recognised. The advantage of having the legumes is that they're going to be much higher in minerals and trace elements than grasses are. So that there's uh, nu nutritional benefits there for animals from ha from having those legumes, but it doesn't have to be legumes. There's been a whole lot of research being taken under around the world now of diverse uh, pastures that have non-legumes in them, like chicory and plantain and those sorts of things, with a with a diversity of grasses, no legumes at all, and they've actually been more productive than pastures containing legumes. So it doesn't have to be legumes; just has to be non-grasses. So do you graze that as well? So this is not a grazing situation. Ah. This is in a garden farm, you know, circular, a large garden type of farm. Uh, with okay. Well, it's not a crazy idea. It's a fantastic idea. And what some farmers are doing now, um, not sure about the United States, but I've seen this in Europe and I've seen it in Australia, in that when they're putting a diverse pasture mix in, they'll put some grasses and some chicory and plantain and that sort of thing, and then they'll put like a salad bowl mix of you know, salad greens and some rocket and um, maybe some silver beet and some English spinach and things like that. And then they're on a rotational grazing system, so the animals will be coming around maybe every 50 or 60 days. Before the animals get in, they go uh, have pickers come in and just hand pick all the salad greens, take them off to the farmer's market, sell them for, a, a, you know, a really good return on the effort. And it's just so easy to grow them because... It's not like growing in a market garden where you've got to worry about weeds and all that sort of thing. They're just growing in a pasture situation um, and, and they're picking them, selling those, and then once they've been picked, then the, then the stock can come in. And they don't get to pick all of them, so there's still some left for the stock. Um, and also some dairy farmers have put in what they call a snack paddock. <laughs> I love the name of it. So when the cows have just been milked, they can go into the snack paddock for half an hour. And they'll all hang around and wait. They know that they're going to get left in there. So you don't even have to have a special holding paddock for them. Once they've, been, once they've been in there once, they know it's there. And once they've been milked, they'll go out and just stand there and wait to get let. They all have to get let in at once because they can only go in there for half an hour. The snack paddock has got things like silver beet and, and beetroot and, and uh, 
um, it's got chicory and plantain and all those things, but it'll probably have coriander and parsley and like a whole lot of herbs that we, we would eat as well. And the cows just absolutely love it. I mean, they will just they'll stand there for hours waiting to get let in and getting them out again is always a bit of an issue. But they know that when they come to get milk, they're going to get let in. So they know the, the value, the nutritional value of having that. And it only has to be a small area. It adds hugely to their milk production, all those sorts of things. So I think people are realising from a whole lot of different perspectives what the value. But that's great that you can use that as a value-adding thing as well, you know, that you, you can pick those things and sell them and you can also incorporate that with a grazing system. Yep. Yep. Yeah, the microbes are pulling on it. Like the microbes need it to, and they're actually, it's like a calf on a cow. She'll produce milk if she's got a calf on her. She won't produce as much milk if she hasn't got a calf pulling on that milk. Yeah. Well, it's an inert form of carbon. So it's not, it doesn't make, uh, as far as CO2 sequestration goes, it's not going to change it at all whether you have it there or not. It's not either going to have either a positive or a negative effect, except that it can provide a home for mycorrhizal fungi because it's got lots of little holes in it. It's like honeycomb if you look at it under a microscope. And if they're being the mycorrhizal fungi, like these little um, soft uh, strands of cytoplasm that's full of sugar, other things love to eat them. So it's quite protective if they can sort of hide, if you like, if they can find habitat in. Biochar can provide habitat for mycorrhizal fungi. But in terms of affecting carbon sequestration, I mean, it, you've improved the carbon level of your soil if you've added biochar. You've just put some carbon there. But it's not going to affect how much carbon actually flows out of those plant roots. It's not going to have a negative effect on it, if, you, if that's what you mean. Yeah. Yeah, no. No, it's not going to. Because there's a different... We're talking about very active carbon here that's coming streaming out of these plant roots, what we call labile carbon. And what you're talking about is a very stable, stabilised form of carbon that's not, it's not an active carbon form in the soil at all, other than providing habitat. Um, what I did want to show... Oh, okay, I've forgotten what I wanted to... I just wanted to give you an example of how common mycorrhizal... Like when you put lots of species together, and here's the flowers again, I just love the love sunflowers and, and a whole lot of other plants all in together and you get the common mycorrhizal network actually draws down more carbon than if that was just a monoculture of one kind of plant. When they're all working together, that underground network gets much larger and actually pulls more carbon out of the atmosphere. And Gabe Brown is a classic example of that. His name's come up several times over the last two days. Um, this is one of his fields that has uh, looked like the photo I just showed you. It's all been grazed down now. Those cows are just ready to come out. Um, and you can see that you, the soil is completely covered with what they've trampled. Um, they've grazed about a third of it, trampled about a third of it, and left about a third of it. And that's how he likes it to be. So it's time for them to come out now. Um, but when you look at his soil carbon data, Tim mentioned that this this morning, uh, sometime today, whenever Tim was talking, but he's gone from about 1% soil carbon. This was, data was put together by David Johnson. Um, at New Mexico State University, and it's gone up to over 6%. So he's got six times the amount of soil carbon that he originally had, and he's gone through all these different iterations of trying different things, going from uh, conventional cultivation to no-till, then putting in crop rotations, and that's rotations of monocultures, and then going to cover crops, but again, they were monocultures to begin with, then getting into multi-species cover crops, and then finally integrating livestock to actually graze those multi-species crops. And 2008 was when he stopped using nitrogen fertiliser. And from that point on, we've got this almost exponential increase in carbon here. But it's a combination of all of those things, the multi-species, the livestock integration, and the fact that he stopped using nitrogen fertiliser. It'd be very hard to sort of pull any of those factors out in isolation, but obviously in combination, they've had a very good effect. So if you were talking about sequestering carbon for climate benefits, um, there's your answer really in a way of, putting all those things together. But I think a very significant part of that is pulling out that nitrogen fertiliser as well. Just a, an example from Ontario in Canada of a demonstration farm where they've got different 
kinds of plants that you could put into a multi-species crop so that farmers can see, well, what do radishes look like? What do sunflowers look like? What do oats look like? What does spacelia look like? Uh, when they're all grown on their own and buckwheat, you know, like a whole lot of different crops that are used in multi-species crops. So, and then putting them all together in three-way mixes and six-way mixes and nine-way mixes so that farmers can just come to a field day, walk around and see what all those different crops look like and what it would look like if they put them all together. The thing that really caught my attention was um, you can just see if you look at the, in the background, these, these plots were, um, so there's a line here there's something different growing there and then there's another line here and then in the background you can see other crops as well. Um, so they're quite big areas of each. But ne right next to this one, on the right hand side of this one, so this is radish. It had been fertilised, like they put base fertiliser through the whole thing, just a low level of base fertiliser. But it was obviously clearly nitrogen deficient. And right next to it, um, unless I press the button, Thanks for telling me to do that the other day, Don. It makes a big difference. Right next to it is the same. This is radish here with a little bit of oats in it, a little bit of phacelia. That's the only phacelia plant I could actually find in the whole plot. And a couple of sunflowers here, there, here and there, but mostly radish. And it's absolutely not nitrogen deficient at all. They're right next to each other. I've just put those two photos next to each other. But look at the difference in the colour. And so there's been no difference in the fertiliser, but a but a difference in, in uh, diversity. It's just mind-blowing what diversity can do. And a very famous experiment that's come out of Germany, the Jena experiment, it's been running for 15 years now. They had one, two, four, eight or 16 different plant species and it was multifactorial. They had zero, 100 or 200 kilos of nitrogen per hectare per year, so you just translate that to pounds per acre. And it was every combination of everything. So a monoculture, one, one species with none, 100 or 200 kilos, right up to 16 different plant species together with none, 100 or 200 kilos. And what they found is that if they had eight or 16 plant species together, they outperformed with zero nitrogen, outperformed having one or two plant species with 200 pounds per acre of nitrogen. So having one or two plant species, having a monoculture with 200 pounds per acre of nitrogen was not able to produce as much biomass as having eight or 16 plants in together with no nitrogen. And that's, this experiment is very comprehensive. It's all written up in the scientific literature and they just did it, everything done like to the nth degree as the Germans tend to do. Uh, it's Jena, Y-E-N-A, uh, Y, J, J-E-N-A, pronounced Y, yeah, J-E-N-A. Uh, if you Google it, you'll find lots of stuff about it on uh, on the internet. And if anyone wants the papers, I can send them to you. I've got all their papers. Their papers have just come out. Some have come out this year and some come out last year. So they started in 2002. So 2017 has been 15 years. What they did find was that as they had more and more plants in their in their trial areas, they got more and more carbon sequestered underneath those plants. So species richness was the most important a factor for soil carbon sequestration. You really just cannot do it with, well you can do it in a limited way with monocultures but I think we've, start, we've got to really start looking at the significance of diversity in our agricultural systems and some Canadian research that showed if they increase the number of plants in, the, in a grassland, again it's like this is you know, being hand planted by, by people, like a, what do you call it, like a managed grassland, if they had 10 species if they went from just grassland with one species to grassland with 10 species, that it had twice the economic value of just going from one species to two. And that economic value was, in other words, it was more productive and it was more productive because you had improved rates of carbon sequestration that improved water infiltration, water retention, plant growth rates, biomass production, yield quality, all of those sorts of things. So again, that research shows the importance of diversity. New Zealand farmers now have started thank heavens, going from ryegrass monocultures to diverse uh, multi-species lays, they call them L-E-Y-S, pasture lays, often without grasses in them. They might just put a whole mix of um, chicory and plantain and uh, other, other herbs. Sometimes they'll put culinary herbs in there as well. That one has got a little bit of grass in them, but I have seen some of them with no grasses at all. What they've found when they've done that is that they've had... Um, 
it's replaced their nitrogen and phosphorus fertiliser. They haven't had to use any. So this is really the answer to New Zealand's um, water quality problems that the farmers that, you know, they're going to have to have a permit to farm and the government's imposing a regulation on how much nitrogen they use. But if they go to one of these uh, herbal lays, they won't have to use any nitrogen at all. So it'll be very easy to meet that permit. Um, they also found they don't have to use fungicides or insecticides. Their milk production has increased. Their butterfat content's increased. Uh, their mastitis level in their cows has gone down. The laminitis level, which is sore feet, in their cows has gone down. Liver dysfunction, liver diseases have gone down. And some of them have forgotten the phone number for the vet. <laughs> <laughs> so I might just end it there. I think you've got the... <laughs> So um, it, while you're still here, we have a Kiss the Ground trailer that I was going to show, but I don't want her to not, not answer questions. Oh. Yeah, where's Daddy doing the clothes? Oh, it's like... Oh, that's right. Sorry. <laughs> We're all supposed to be over there, aren't we? Sorry. I'll get there.